Hi, everyone. How amazing to see you here. Um, I hope all of you were able to hear from Hallie and the amazing panelists uh, just in the last session. If you didn't, don't worry about it. We have the recording. It will be ready in about 48 hours. And I am so excited that you are here to hear from these two amazing and inspirational women. Um, I had the opportunity to sit down with Aggie and Kat gone last week. Um, and it felt like I was sitting inside their living room in New York. And, uh, and I just, you know, feel inspired by the whole uh, conversation. And I feel that you are going to feel the same. And uh, let's get started um, here, Aggie and Kat gone. Welcome everyone uh, to, you know, this third session of the We Give Summit. We're so happy to have you here. And I am just personally excited, and I know you will be too, uh, for this fireside chat with um, an amazing duo, mother and daughter duo. Um, I, we're going to be talking with Agnes and Catherine Gund, and I feel so, um, excited, inspired, because for me, there's nothing more powerful than a conversation between two people that love each other. Um, I, you know, I haven't seen my mom in, in a year and four months. Or am I getting emotional? And this is crazy. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, I haven't seen her since, since December of 2019 because of the pandemic. So I, I see you two together and I would love to be with my mom. Um, so I'm just going to pass it to you to have a conversation, talk about, you know, your family, your philanthropy, your careers, and how everyone can take what they have to make this world a, a better world. Um, so with you, Agnes and Catherine, better known as Aggie and Kat Gunn. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's really wonderful to be here. And that made me emotional too. We've all um, lost so much during COVID and, and there's no one who didn't uh, lose something that mattered to them in their life, whether it was a time or an experience or being with people or actually uh, losing loved ones. And, you know, or habits, there's, there's things that, you know, people keep talking about, I'm not a silver linings person. So I don't see it as, oh, but these are the good things that came out of it. But I do celebrate and feel deep gratitude for the, for the things that were positive during, during COVID. And one was that we did get to be together and with um, several of my children, for a, a, especially at the beginning of quarantine. And so I hope you get to be with your mom soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And this was totally non- <laughs> no, we heard my I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I think I will start um, because other people may not know my mother um, of, of asking her to talk about, about who she is and a little about her mother and, and her own childhood. Um, she had a short time with her mother, but it was an important time. Well, um, there were six of us in the family, so, and we were in seven years. We were born within a period of seven years. So you can imagine, I don't think I know of anyone who has that um, one child after another. Um, very intense. Very intense. You started out that way. Your first intense. child, my brother David is one year older than me. And then she gave it a little break after I was, you had two in a row and then three years and for Jessica and, and three, three more years. years for Anna. And so, um, I, ours was very different. Uh, there, my children were very differently brought up than I was. Um, and they, because we lived on a, a big swath of land where there was hardly anybody around us. It was fields and I used to get A's in um, biology because I could bring in tadpoles and, you know, all different things that lived out there. 
And um, we did spend a lot of our time, even though we went to school and had somewhat of a life, um, we, outside of our own, you know, sort of circle, we did have a donkey. We had um, some other ducks and chickens and rabbits and uh, all kinds of things like that. And um, maybe that's part of why you're so family oriented. You're so at the core. You always return to the foundation of family. You always return to being with your children and your grandchildren, and even though you have such an expansive life and so many people in your world and you have a busy world. But I think you're and even your brothers and sister returning to this kind of family route. Yeah, I, I think most of us in our our family are still very close. Um, we see each other, you know, fairly regularly. Um, we don't have the, the pictures that you have in the background and we you um, do actually have those they're just not in the background but there are thousands of pictures all over your office and your bedroom and yeah but that. those are not what most people see so <clears throat> it's um very different than um if we had uh things out that were out in the room but um, you do have art around and maybe you could talk about why art from the very beginning was so always so important to you. Why did you gravitate towards, I mean, so, surrounding yourself with incredible, inspiring, healing, challenging, provocative art? Well, we didn't set out to do that. We, uh, you know, because my father died when we were younger, mother died years before and was sick a good deal of the time that she was alive when we were alive um we we really had certain things we did on the weekends when we were out of school and those were included going to the cleveland museum which mm -hmm. was very nearby and um having children's classes and we went from the you know, one, one day we would be um, in the armor room and the next day we would be in the Egyptian room. And um, so we we got to know the Cleveland Museum very well. He was also interested in the Cleveland Institute of Art. Um, and that was nearby. Why do you think he, that's interesting. I haven't put that together before that because he was interested, he was the chair of the board, right? Or he was, there's a big bust, a bust <laughs> of her father when you enter the Cleveland Institute of Art, which is one of the world renowned art college programs in the, in the country. And when you enter that space, there's this bust of him. So he had a big role there and it makes me realize that not only was he interested in education um, and art, but he was interested in artists. And your focus has been so much about the people behind the art. Well, there's a long story, which isn't um, you know, necessary to get into why my father wasn't head of the Cleveland Museum or anything well, like that. Let's not get into it. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, but he was very involved in this art school which is the point of an art school is to support artists, to give artists. Yes, and they did have a May Day event every um, May, May. <laughs> obviously. And it was um, always about those people that w were to show their products, what they made, what they, um, which was very often in, ID, which was uh, industrial mm -hmm. design, and yeah. it was not the painting so much that ever captivated people. It was what they um, produced in making cars and doing things that had electronic um, 
Yeah. But it was about practical. It was almost yeah. combining art and trade. It was about the daily application of the imagination. Yeah. And he had a collection at home um, uh, that was around everything that was other than that of Remington, Russell, Tenney Johnson, Tree Vogel. He really Those, liked these, these sort of, they were called Western art. Well, he, um, and the horses, he was a stuntman in the rodeo, which is a little known fact about your dad. In that oh. movie, I mean, he was like a rodeo stuntman. There's this amazing photograph of a, what kind of, is it? The, a bull, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, it's not, it wasn't a horse, but he's on a bull and the bull is up like that and his head, he's fallen off and his head is on the ground and his feet are in the air and they caught it, which would have been an amazing photograph because they didn't have, you know, this technology now that you can get every second. Um, so he, but he likes the web. And I always think of that piece that you have in the house where the horse is, oh, actually going this way. But anyway, that piece that he had when you were when you were little. So here's a question I want to ask you. You said your childhood was so different than mine. So maybe you can help us by introducing me by telling them about my childhood. <laughs> how was it well, different? What do you think is different? How did you parent differently than your parents? Well, we just lived in more urban places. We um, didn't. We, although we were in the country some of the time, yeah. we we were with other people, and and, <laughs> and we instead were. of being just along with the rabbits and the ducks and that and the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that was a difference. That and was. do you think? Yeah, that was a difference. Um, I grew up with a different kind of art, not the Remingtons and the Western art, but I grew up with the Rothko that incredible Rothko and that Hans Hoffman. I grew up with abstract art on the walls of the house that I would see and was exposed to. I didn't have to, even though we did go to lots of museums, I didn't go to the museums on the weekend to see the art. I could see it in the house, which has been, I have to say, one of the, the most generative aspects of my childhood when I think, you know, a lot of people will get to the film I made about my mother, Aggie, but people have said it, they feel like they got to see a glimpse of what it was like to grow up in, in the house, even though it's not sort of a biographical film, it's not like a, but there is, you do get this sense that there was art everywhere um, and, and what that's, what that might be like. Um, yeah. Where do you think, to me, it always comes back to the art and family, but where do you think the empathy that you're so well known for, where do you think that comes from or how early or at what point? Or I know you don't even think of it that way. And I think that's probably right, appropriate. But there is some way that you are able to extend yourself and be vulnerable and open and, and bring yourself and your own experiences and emotions into um, situations that a lot of people shut themselves off from. Well, I've always thought that all you children, when the, the girls in the family, when you bring up how you got, you were very, you know, I don't know where this is going, but let's see. <laughs> very worried about how you cried all the time. Oh, and when true. things happen, you cried, but I, when I was little, I, I was always, I was the second child and the first one, it was a girl. And so I had all these brothers and then my sister came along and I never gave the proper thing to my sister. I never um, gave her much attention, but we were all kids at one time and it was hard to to reach out, but I've always been sorry that I didn't reach out more to her. Because and you feel like identifying, 
that way would have given her more access and you more access to your emotions? No, no, it wasn't emotions. It was um, that we, we didn't have any other route to go. We have had, it was always about, um, you know, a family. It was always this number of kids that were there and um, that. I think it's is, interesting that you raise crying because you used to cry every time you gave a speech, no matter what the speech was made for. Um, and I realized that after college, when I moved to New York City, where you had moved while I was in high school, and I'd go to the speeches and you'd get nervous, and my youngest sister, Anna, and I were on a Zoom meeting yesterday, a meeting, and every time she speaks, she gets so emotional and she cries. And I also did do that. I mean, I think you're right that there's, there's a, I think, I'm, I mean, I'm grateful to you that you've allowed us that access, that you modeled, that it's okay. I mean, we started this entire fireside chat with Sarah sharing some really deep longing that she's been holding for over a year. And she was able to keep talking and connect those feelings, not ignore them, but connect them to actually what this whole conversation is about. And, and I do think that's empathy. So I think that's, you know, that's, it's, it, it's beyond generous, but it is something where you're allowing your curiosity not to be totally transactional. You're allowing yourself to be a participant. And I think that's what makes a deeper change, whether that change is the necessary healing after and because of trauma or because it's the necessary right. path to connect so that you can continue your relationship. It was like last yesterday afternoon when I heard, as everybody did, the uh, outcome of the trial that I did, the first thing I did was cry. And I, I thought that's such a strange reaction because I, I haven't been crying a lot about other things. I didn't cry when one of my good friends, Vartan Gregorian, died the other day. Um, but I felt very, very sad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just thought, uh, how am I going to get through this period when I do feel badly about his loss? But the other was, uh, you know, it was crying from being relieved. Yes. That, that this man was yeah. going to jail, that he wasn't going to get away with this, which has happened so many times before and still continues to happen. There was a killing right after. During the this, reading of the uh, verdict in Columbus. So, yeah, there was incredible relief. I think everybody took a deep exhale and it was a complicated moment because it was such a somatic experience. I think physically people also were unprepared. We were prepared, I think, to respond to the explicit continuation of the injustice that has hounded us since 1619 and before. And I think what happened was that people weren't sure how to feel because obviously you can't believe in the justice of the system. The justice of the system doesn't exist. But in this moment, it felt like there was a power of the people. There was a power of the people that, um, that brought relief for one moment. I mean, what I told my kids, I felt afterwards was at least today's not worse than yesterday. It didn't necessarily get better, but we were expecting that city to burn? No. Well, I I was glad it didn't, and we, yeah, but it was true that by the end of the day, we had uh, another problem, yeah. and that was that it, the killing wasn't going to stop. Yeah. Just because of this um, systemic change. Yeah. But the, we have another change to make, and 
Um, I was interested to see um, the reactions of people on MN MSNBC um, because uh, Joy Reid was the only one that really got into, I thought, into the, but she, she would because yeah. she's black. So, so she knew, she knew she had a lived experience that yeah. was different than some of the other commentators. I'm wondering if we can pivot back to um, talking about sort of the, your history of, of your giving. Um, that, well, I could talk about who would influence me most. And one of the people was a, a, a teacher I had when I was at Farmington, uh, a school that was at that time very unlikely to have people that were so helpful as she was to me. And she she taught me art history. She sent me postcards from places that were small museums. Uh, one, the Isabel Stewart Gardner, uh, another the Phillips, the um, Frick, the Morgan, uh, which I've been, uh, all of which boards I've been on except for. Um, Those are very um, homey museums. I love that. Mm -hmm. They're not only small, but they're places that but, remind you of home. You can sit in a couch or you can sit with the pieces in a smaller room. They're not. Well, you can't sit. You can't sit. Okay. Well. <laughs> No. I was no. going to say, like, I, I don't think you can sit, but you are inside a home. <laughs> oh, you can't. They have all those fancy special. Okay, well, I didn't spend as much time in those museums. Um, but it's interesting, you know, the example of you being on those boards actually is one of the many ways that you give back. I think people, um, you know, we're all interested in ways that people give that maybe are non traditional, so that we're all. It, it's different than just sitting down with your checkbook and writing a check and sending it off and sort of donating to a charity, quote unquote. I mean, I think a lot of the audience here gives in giving circles. They give together, whether it's through identity or family bond or friendship, um, and they make decisions in groups that help strategize and also leverage their own funding. And obviously, another way, you know, convening people, educating yourself, educating others, but serving on the boards of so many organizations, including all these arts organizations and museums, has been one way that you've really consistently given back over the course of your life. Well, I, I didn't do that without mentors. I had quite a few mentors that I look to most of them women. Mm -hmm. um, Helen Button Weiser was one, and her children have been fabulous. And um, and and also Irene Diamond. I think she yeah, was very influential. She, she was um, certainly an influence. And she was. Um, I I remember when because we've been having so many. Um, periods of life ending that um, I can remember when, um, you know, she was around that um, I, I went often to meetings for Connecticut College because they were trying to find a uh, new director and we had to look at what people were like and I remember um, her having she Is and the Helen other trustees, yeah, 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 Helen Buttonweiser and the other trustees that were on the committee to choose this person um, were all very excited about this one man who they met and thought was, and he was able to give them a wonderful feeling of who he was. And um, I remember meeting with him and after I met with him, I went back and told the people that he really wasn't right for the college because he didn't like women. And oh, well, we, that would be a problem <laughs> for a women's college. <laughs> yeah, and that was so, not good. I mean, that's an interesting note because actually I think what it exemplifies is, is how you do bring a really incisive, direct, um, analysis and, and feedback 
to any of the work you're doing. You don't just come in and um, go along with something. If you're going to be there and bring yourself, not only will you bring your emotions, but you you bring what you know and you'll share it readily. And and you know you, you're. I think that's a really important. And and actually, I want to pivot to art for justice, but that's been really true in art for justice. Is that it's an example, I think, to this audience of a group of people with Aggie's leadership certainly coming together and working together and making a difference together. Um, but it's one where you never shy away from saying, I mean, there's ways that, there's things that people have that are their signatures. Aggie's able to look at something and immediately, visually, uh, see what's missing. Um, I just remember one meeting, just to jump ahead, where we were looking at a flyer or some graphic that was about the Art for Justice Fund. And you said, there just aren't enough women on here. And there, you know, it was a whole fly, like pamphlet. And so there was artwork and there were profiles and pictures and different things. And there were some of a lot of different things, but there were just clearly not enough women. And she just was like, I just want to make that point. And then that became really useful information for us. But let's back up and say, what is the Art for Justice Fund? Um, in 2018, you went to a movie, which I am a documentary filmmaker. So, you know, Ava DuVernay, uh, The Incredible, has spoken about this clearly, very beautifully herself. But well, seeing I, I, a I'll, movie I'll, had this impact. I'll tell you what had that happened. Way. I was with uh, a very good friend of yours, um, Marcus Hsu, and his boyfriend, Ross, and then um, Cindy Sherman. And the four of us were supposed to go see Ava DuVernay's film after we had supper. The 13th. I didn't want to go because I thought it'd be too rough and, you know, too difficult. But I, I finally was persuaded to go because they had the tickets. And it was the first night of um, the wonderful festival that they have um, that she was to give to give by talking um, some about this film. And it was really mind blowing to me. The, the whole film was very much, um, you know, changed my life because it, I didn't know much more than that about what happened. I didn't have the statistics or anything that she brought in this film to the forefront of, about prisons. I had no idea that prisons were one of the most awful things we have and very unjust and very unfair to a whole segment of the population that was mostly in the prisons at the time um, uh, or had a lot of um, people that were in the prisons. And uh, it really woke me up. And from then, I you know, knew about Brian Stevenson and, um, you know, Michelle all Alexander. Michelle Alexander, and everybody seemed to come up to the fore. Right. That was, I never went to the film on the, I never went to the place you went, the plantation that was so terrible. Angola, the horrible Angola. plantation prison. But it was an amazing moment because it was really a tipping point, I think, for Aggie to see that film and to have that experience. And she immediately acted. And that, to me, was such a just a vibrant and, and remarkable moment because she said she doesn't buy and sell paintings. She's, she buys paintings and then gives them to museums for the most part. And um, she thought, there, I have a painting, I'm going to sell it because I can use the intention behind the sale to invest in promoting decarceration, getting more people safely, reducing the population in the prisons, of making sure that we reinvest in communities so that and this isn't our only choice, and also changing the narrative. And so, so that we're not thinking about criminalism and 
and and punishment for but thinking about healing. People that do things like Susan Burton does, mm -hmm. which is one of the people that I've liked most in this whole journey, and she um, makes these houses and then has done enough houses so that she doesn't uh, isn't in touch with every one of them now, but she has moved from there to working more uh, with. Um, populations Activities. that that yeah. need to be recognized and need to have, um, uh, you know, she's in Southern California, and yeah, and she, um, she it's about re-entry and women coming home, yeah, and having another, family and a home again. And another one that I talked about before is um, this one that. Um, is in prison at Bard College as part of their um, their which one the Bard Prison Project yeah the their, Bard. which is the college's college in prison which is an incredible program and there's a new documentary a four part documentary called uh, College Behind Bars that people can check out that we helped make sure that theories got out to different people who might not tune into PBS. And, and so that's how we've tried to intervene and participate. But I think one of the fascinating things about Art for Justice is how you, you had this money that seeded the fund. And one of the most important things is that it's a five year spend down. It was to say, we're gonna get the money out into the field now. We wanna end mass incarceration now. We're not endowing a fund forever and ever and ever. We wanna- I love that. Yeah, it's really a sort of reparations model, like the leadership is in the field. There's so many formerly incarcerated people, artists, advocates, uh, teachers, scientists, everybody coming out. Um, and there's and they're the ones who whose leadership is going to be most effective and and they don't have the resources. And that's where we can share and we all have a role. And then, but from the beginning, you asked other people to join you, yeah, other collectors. But, uh, I, I think that's important, and uh, we'll get to that, but I think what some of the people have done, um, and I forget his name now, but you'll give it to me, um, in Florida, where they, Desmond, Mead. De Desmond Mead brought together a, a group of felons, they were felons, formerly incarcerated, formerly people. incarcerated people, and they um, have changed the whole outlook with the help of LeBron James and other people that were well known. But we uh, always supported him and uh, have supported him since in what he's been doing. And he, in Florida, let me just give some detail, which is that in Florida, um, formerly incarcerated pe people who've been convicted of felony charges were not allowed to vote. Um, and so he led the charge that really changed and brought over 70% of the voting people in Florida voted to say people with felony convictions could vote when they can, they'd done their time. They were told that this is what they had to, this was their they punishment and it was 1.4 million people. And I, and I and love I that you pay. know, you know, sh that you're, that Charges. you've got these examples of of the ways that the grants that we're making, but can you talk about bringing the other donors along with you? Well, we've luckily had donors, but we've had uh, so many um, people that have been made aware of this, um, uh, you know, problem. of this problem that, that the incarceration people face, which includes, um, in prison um, work, letting them do things which they really aren't in many places allowed to have. And that there's more realization that uh, the one thing that's really great is that they um, don't put under 16 years old people in, in in they used to solitary juveniles, not only in solitary, but they could sentence them to life in prison. Um, so that's changing as a result of the work over the last years. I mean, we really, with Art for Justice, joined, I like to say, we jumped into a moving river 
we we didn't start this thing we're not going to yeah. end this movement yeah but the movement um is ready is primed has been doing the work has been making the change has been raising the flag and 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 you know making the clarion call and for years and years and years as it has morphed from slavery i mean it's it's the same work of harriet tubman that susan burton is doing to free people get people out of a system that is so unjust and i i think where we've also had an effect is that when bail comes up and and they right, don't the have cash money bail money for cash bail there. Okay, but you have to talk about other collectors and other donors that you've attracted to the fund. Why did you think it was important that there be other people, not just you? Well, um, it's because no, nothing that is forward looking or in the future works by itself. That's exactly that right. There's not, nobody, I mean, Darren didn't come into a place that was, you know, void of any um, responsibility. The uh, Ford Foundation has always to, been good. We have to and, work together, but I think that that's, you know, I think Art for Justice has done two things. One, it has elevated the connection of donors to each other but and to the work, but it's also, I think, allowing the movement to create space or make space or or, or have space for everyone to have their role so that we call it sort of a three-legged stool of the allied donors, the activists, and the artists, and that we have to work together. Nobody can just sort of dip in and dip out. We have to really remain together, working together to make a sustainable, changed future. And it's a and it's a dicey proposition. It doesn't, you know, it's inelegant and it's been tested and tried and it doesn't always work. But I think what's been a beautiful model with Art for Justice is not only the collectors, there were 30 individuals and couples who joined from the very beginning. Um, but then as we went along, it's been incredibly moving to see how inspired some artists have been. And it started with Mark Bradford. Aggie wouldn't have asked artists, they're asked all the time to give, 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 give. She was asking collectors and gallerists and people um, with money. And in and Mark Bradford met two of our grantee partner artists, and he was so inspired. He he created an edition of his artwork, and gave us the entire um, proceeds right. from the sales, which raised over a million dollars for Art for Justice. And then one of our grantee partner artists, Dwayne Betts and Titus Kafar then sold an edition of their own and gave us the sale from one of the pieces in the edition back into the fund. And it's been such an, an amazing model. And now Jeff Coombs, Mark DeSuvero, but we're getting prepared for one of Aggie's and my favorite people in the world, Julie Maritou, who's a wonderful artist, has a huge mid-career um, show up at the Whitney Museum right now. And she is finishing up a painting that she is going to donate. And it, when it sells in the spring, she will become the second largest donor to the fund, second behind Aggie. And, and I think inspiring, it's been beautiful to see, I think Aggie's, a, if I may, the kind of donor who likes to just do it. She's like, here, just do it. Like she wants the work to get done. If she's got the resource, she wants to just do it. And, it, and she doesn't honk her horn or put her name up on things. She's just sort of, giving the money and sharing the resources. But um, I think in this case, it really was about saying, I can't do this alone. It's not gonna happen if one person does it. We have to work together, it has to be sustained. And even though we're doing five years, we need people to keep doing it after that because the problems aren't all gonna go away. And certainly this one is intractable as we saw with the, the reading of the verdict while a police officer was murdering a young girl. Um, and so I think it's been beautiful to see how people are working together. And in fact, our five-year spend down now has one additional year because of the donations that other people have given and the artists have given. So we're really using our sixth year to kind of 
think towards the future, think about public art, think about things that will endure, think about ways to resource uh, smaller, formerly incarcerated uh, leadership programs that can then continue um, to make sure that there's the narrative change that we believe in going forward, that it doesn't sort of fall off a cliff. And there have been so many more funders who've come into the field. And one of the beautiful things is that the Ford Foundation, Aggie's friend Darren Walker, who works with us, and the Rockefeller Philanthropies Fund have put in all the money for all the administrative and staffing costs. So every cent that goes into Art for Justice goes into the field. And that's been important because it means that we're not trying to raise money for the organization. So when people say, I'm really interested in juvenile justice, and we say, look, campaign for the fair sentencing of youth is an incredibly effective, wonderful, small organization. You could just give them a donations directly. And one person, a friend of Aggie's who's worked with Art for Justice now is their largest donor and greatest supporter and champion and works directly with the organization. So we don't need that money to come through us. We don't need to take a percentage of, we just want the money to get out there. And I think that's made it kind of in the giving circle parlance, maybe one of those radiating drops in the water where this is the giving circle, but it's affecting and creating resources and community that extend far beyond the center. More. Totally. I think, you know, you, you both have mentioned the power of coming together, right? Um, you know, what happened, um, even with the, with the verdict, as you said, there were the power of people really, you know, influencing and pushing, even though people were not expecting the verdict the power was behind all these people, right? Uh, with Art for Justice, um, you, your work, Aggie, has been so inspiring that other people have come together. Uh, right now, as you said, you know, you have six years uh, to, to spend down, but I am, you know, I'm thinking that as so many young new leaders will come along to continue the work you know, in, in, and to do it full circle, as you said, because you have these art collectors, but also you have this grantee artists and, and everybody in between. So everybody is given at the moment, you know, what they have, how they can. And, and that is such a powerful, you know, uh, message because exactly, um, Kat, that's how giving circles work, right? It, it's the power of the collective. And it's not only, you know, the financial, gift but how do we go beyond the dollars how do we do we become advocates and ambassadors for the causes that we that we care about i um, think about it as being really not charity you know when i was well younger it was still looked at as charity something you would do to help someone else and i think our giving certainly mine and i think aggies has really evolved into more of a solidarity mo model and so it's solidarity, not charity. And that allows a much more substantial, I think, impact and a sustainable potential. Totally, totally. And uh, can we talk a little bit about your film, about Agis? Sure. Feel, Agis film? So, so I'm a documentary filmmaker. And when I was younger, people who I love and people who love Aggie would come up to me and say, when are you gonna make a movie about your mom? And I was like, never. I'm never making a movie about my own mother. That's not something I'm ever gonna do. And then she did this incredible thing, which I think of as alchemy, which is she turned art into investing in the imagination to end mass incarceration through the intention behind the sale. There are a lot of art collectors who are philanthropists. There are a lot of philanthropists who collect art. This was slightly different because she said, this painting is going to help me work on, with other people to end mass incarceration. And, and I just thought that is something I, 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 what I really thought was, how do we become, first, I didn't start making a movie. I just wanted to record some interviews with my mom and I was explicitly not making a movie. And she had said I could, which was nice because she's notoriously camera shy and there's no footage. And I thought, I'll just ask her some of these questions. It's been so nice today to get to sit and ask these questions again. I mean, I just don't think we ask enough questions. So it was more of a mother-daughter experience. And 
our first interview was so boring and terrible. And so I said, I, I don't know how to do this. It was just one-on-one. -on -one. And she was like, you know, the answers, why are you asking? You know, it wasn't, she didn't say that, but I, I didn't, it, it was very hard. And, but I realized that I have four kids and they were sort of all in their late teens and kind of transitioning into adulthood and moving out of the house. And I thought maybe before these twins go off to college, I could just film them talking to you for an hour each. And she said, absolutely. And I said, you guys can talk about whatever you want. They wrote up some questions and they brought a sheet of paper and they both went. And then I thought, well, the other two should do it. And then, and so then we had, and they're all in the movie. You see one of them's laying on the bed with her, which is a particular delight because he's a little bit younger than the others. Um, and, and I just thought that's nice. And she said, I, I said, we both agreed that that was easier than me asking her. And it was still not for a movie. But even my crew would come to the set and be like, oh, I spent the weekend with my parents filming them on my iPhone because I wanted to, you know, hear some of their stories. Um, and so then we asked, we had some friends of hers and some artists and Darren and Julie and different people like that. And I didn't tell them what to say. I said, I just want to film you in a conversation. And they were all very eager to do it. And they talked about what they wanted, which you see through the film. Um, and we shot over 30 of them. But after about 10 or 12, um, my producing partner from Auden Pictures said, you know, you really do have to make a film out of this. And there was a, and anyway, I was convinced. And what I, the reason I made it was because I wanted to see how she had gone from this very segregated, sheltered childhood in the 40s um, into somebody who would, do what she did and start the Art for Justice Fund, respond to seeing a movie about this subject matter, which affected her deeply because of how she feels about our, the divisions in our society and the inequities in our society and the unfairness. And she did this thing and I thought, how do you, how do we become people? How are my children becoming who they are? It's where you started um, with this, which is, where'd you come from? How, how are, how come you may not even be like your siblings who are the same race, they have the same parents, they grew up in the same era, you know, but you still might be different. So what affects us? And I think I took that as the kind of organizing principle of the film was to end on art for justice, because I think it's so inspiring in so many ways because of our grantee partners and the movement that is happening, which I think is learning to prioritize healing, which I don't think we have prioritized in the past when we're trying to change policies and when we're trying to address urgent direct needs of hunger and housing. Um, I think that, you know, so what I thought was, what do we need to know every step back from that? So that's why I say it's not a biographical or chronological film, even though obviously there are elements of biography. But I wanted to know how did, what was the line from Studio in a School, which is the education, arts education program in the New York City public schools that Aggie began in the mid 70s, when they were all cut out from millions of children around no arts. And she started this program. I was like, what's the line? Like, what did that teach her? Like, how did she create that? And actually, one of my sons said one of my most favorite responses to the movie, after he saw the first cut, he said, um, and it makes me emotional. He said, you know, if we'd had studio in a school for everybody, we wouldn't have needed art for justice because studio in a school, which is about children checking their, having a voice and checking what they want to say and what they think and what their questions are and learning how to express those things and realizing they can have creativity instead of destruction. They can create instead of destroy. And, and learning these beautiful things that one of the students says so remarkably in the movie. But he says, you know, every other classroom in school asked me for the answer. And the only place was in the art studio, in the art room. When I went in there, there was no answer. They were asking me what I think, not what I know, not if I was going to get it right. There was no right, wrong. There was no answer. They were asking me what I think and nowhere else in his entire education system were they doing that. And if people were taught all those things, all of us, we wouldn't 
be so focused on punishing and hurting and destroying and violence and oh. all the things that the prison industrial complex are. We would be able to have people who are able to contribute. When Aggie and I go into the prisons, it's always incredible for me to watch how she engages with people inside who she sees as artists and teachers and fathers. And she's not going in there saying, oh, you're a criminal, you're a murderer, you're this, you're that. She goes in and, you know, it's at San Quentin, they have an art studio. And we went to the art studio there once and Aggie went around and talked to everybody. I mean, we couldn't get her out of the art studio. I was like, there's other, we were gonna go see the, the, the filmmaking, you know, the TV, it, the closed circuit TV production place where there's a radio show and the newspaper and they have a prison and university program. Um, but Aggie was in the studio talking to people about their artwork and what they saw and why they were making it and, and, and how they saw it changing and what it did for them, what it meant to them. And I think those, those are the reasons I made the movie. It's called Aggie. It's available on Amazon and iTunes and uh, Google and Voodoo. And we're going to put all the links in the- <laughs> Yeah, you have a trailer. So I'm going to cut away and show the trailer. Um, <laughs> now would be the time. There you go. <laughs> um, that, would, that would be great. Yeah, we have, yeah, and the links for the film. But what did you, why did you, say yes to making the movie. You didn't, you didn't. As you see in the trailer, she says, I hope not too many people see this film, but it really is, it's about women's leadership. It's about uh, the criminal injustice system. It's about philanthropy and it's about art and arts education. Um, and those things may seem like such big buckets, all these different, but they're all like, hugely concentrated right here totally in this person and i know you know we have believe it or not remember all that list of things that we wanted to touch upon this 15 minutes you oh, did yeah. Is it you right? did, did? It's, okay. yeah but you know it's it's perfect because this has been i feel that we could be talking well you could be talking i could be listening for for many, many, many hours. And uh, I am so uh, deeply appreciative of your time and sharing your story. And uh, and definitely we would put the trailer. And I just want to ask, you know, some like parting words for this audience of everyday givers, people that, you know, come together around a living room, around the table to share a meal with each other and to just, you know, share each other's values, find the values of the group, and from there, um, you know, just support the cause and, and, and trying to make this a better world. You know, one thing we didn't say about Art for Justice, we have donors from $5 to $5 million. And it's been so incredible to be able to embrace and include and involve all levels of giving. Um, because as you pointed out, there's also the giving of the artist who makes a piece, the giving of the person who serves as, you know, a collaborator, an advisor with us. There's so many, I think this summer and this experience of the racial reckoning and the, and, the, and the crisis of COVID has really shown us what mutual aid means to all of us. The mutual aid is everybody saying, this is what I have to give emotionally, financially, whatever you have, a cooking skill. And it's allowed everyone to, to gain for themselves from seeing themselves in the struggle of other people and seeing their own future and healing linked so inextricably to the struggle of other people. My parting word would be the Tony K. Bambara quote where she says, we have to make the revolution irresistible. And I feel like that's what's been so lovely about the work that's coming together in this movement, even yesterday, in all the pain of the result of the of the of the verdict in the in the Chauvin murder of George Floyd, that you know there was if you saw the footage in George Floyd Square, people were barbecuing and dancing and hugging and crying, and there was a way that it just felt like we can even share in this moment grief as it might be of, of relief and, and joy and fairness. And that is the future we're, we're aiming for. Totally. Thank you, Kat.
Aggie, any part, any parting words? No, but I, I think uh, Catherine is obviously the spokesperson for <laughs> this film and, um, and everything that has gone along. She wasn't there when I was in college or afterwards, but um, the, as all my children have, they've been there um, mostly for good, for good works and for um, good thoughts. And Catherine is able to express herself really well. And so it, it's made for a uh, wonderful um, film that was, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, it didn't have, <laughs> you know, I didn't know that this was what would be the outcome, but it's been, wonderful to have her um, there and to have what she is able to give to all this and has learned through her own initiative about um, this kind of gathering together of resources that she put back, given back to the community. So I really appreciate her for that. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I mean, as you can see, my only job there was just to nod and to let them talk and, and have this intimate conversation with each other. And I know this session was longer than 50 minutes, um, but we, we wanted you to hear the whole story. Um, Thank you so much for listening to this amazing duo. And of course, we didn't have time to put the trailer for Aggie, but I know in the chat there are all the links. And we'll see you tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific for the pop-up Giving Circle. Let's have impact in 75 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>